Chapter Three of Poems of American History, Volume Five the period of expansion this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by greg giordano poems of american history volume 5 the period of expansion by various chapter three the conquest of the plains the indians had long ceased to be a serious menace to the united states and the policy of the government for many years had been to settle them upon various selected tracts of land west of the mississippi but the population of the west was increasing very rapidly the completion of the railway to the pacific having given it a great impetus the pacific railway finished may tenth eighteen sixty nine and a highway shall there be tis done the wondrous thoroughfare type of that highway all divine no ancient wonder can compare with this in grandeur of design for twas no visionary scheme to immortalize the builder's name no impulse rash no transient dream of some mere worshipper of fame rare common sense conceived the plan for working out a lasting good the full development of man the growth of human brotherhood and lo by patient toil and care the work with rare success is crowned and nations yet to be will share in blessings that shall e'er abound across a continent's expanse the lengthening track now runs secure o'er which the iron horse shall prance so long as earth and time endure his course extends from east to west from where atlantic billows roar to where the quiet waters rest beside the far pacific shore proud commerce by atlantic gales tossed to and fro her canvas rent will gladly furl her wearied sails and glide across a continent through smiling valleys broad and free o oh, rivers wide or mountain crest her course shall swift and peaceful be Till she has reached the farthest west and even the treasures of the east diverted from their wonted track with safety gained with speed increased will follow in her footsteps back and thus the nations greatly blessed will share another triumph one that links yet closer east and west the rising and the setting sun this glorious day with joy we greet may faith abound may love increase and may this highway now complete be the glad harbinger of peace god bless the work that it may prove the source of greater good in store when man shall heed the law of love and nations shall learn war no more c r ballard during the autumn of eighteen seventy four gold was discovered in the black hills sioux reservation and explorers rushed in a still worse grievance was the wanton destruction of bison by hunters and excursionists driven to fury at last tribe after tribe of savages took up arms and started on a career of murder and rapine after the comanches saddle 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 mount mount and away over the dim green prairie straight on the track of day spare not spur for mercy hurry with shout and thong fiery and tough is the mustang the prairie is wide and long saddle 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 
leap from the broken door where the brute comanche entered and the white foot treads no more the hut is burnt to ashes there are dead men stark outside and only a long torn ringlet left of the stolen bride go like the east winds howling ride with death behind stay not for food or slumber till the thieving wolves ye find they came before the wedding swifter than prayer or priest the bridemen danced to bullets the wild dogs ate the feast look to rifle and powder buckle the knife belt sure loose the coil of the lasso and make the loop secure fold the flask in the poncho fill the pouch with maize and ride as if to-morrow were the last of living days saddle 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 redden spur and thong ride like the mad tornado the track is lonely and long spare not horse nor rider fly for the stolen bride bring her home on the crupper a scalp on either side it was decided to transfer the sioux to another reservation but under the advice of sitting bull they refused to stir a detachment under lieutenant colonel george a custer was sent against them and came suddenly upon their encampment on june twenty five eighteen seventy six a terrific fight followed in which custer and all of his men were killed down the little big horn june twenty five eighteen seventy six down the little big horn o troop forlorn right into the camp of the sioux what was the muster two hundred and sixty-two went into the fight with custer went out of the fight with custer went out at a breath staunch to the death just from the canyon emerging saw they the braves of sitting bull surging two thousand and more painted and feathered thirsting for gore did they shrink and turn back hear how the rifles crack did they pause for a life for a sweetheart or wife and one in that savage throng his revenge had waited long pomped with porcupine quills his deerskins beaded and fringed an eagle's plume in his long black hair his tall lance fluttering in the air glanced at the circling hills his cheeks flushed with a keen surmise a demon's hate in his eyes remembering the hour when he cringed a prisoner thonged chief rain in the face there was a sachem wronged saw his enemy's heart laid bare feasted and thought like a beast in his lair cavalry cavalry tramp of the hoof champ of the bit horses prancing cavorting shying and snorting accoutrements rattling children at home are prattling gallantly gallantly company dismount from the saddle they swing with their steeds from a ring hear how the bullets sing who can their courage recount do you blanch at their fate who would hesitate two hundred and sixty-two immortals in blue standing shoulder to shoulder like some granite boulder you must blast to displace were they of a valiant race two hundred and sixty-two and never a man to say i rode with custer that day give the savage his triumph and bluster give the hero to perish with custer to his god and his comrades true closing and closing nearer the redskins creep with cunning disposing with yell and with whoop there are women shall weep they gather and swoop they come like a flood maddened with blood they shriek plying the knife was there one begged for his life where but a moment ago stood serried and sternly the foe 
now fallen mangled below down the little big horn tramp of the hoof champ of the bit a single steed in the morn comanche seven times hit comes to the river to drink lists for the sabre's clink lists for the voice of his master oh glorious disaster comes sniffing the air gazing lifts his head but his master lies dead who but the dead were there but stay what was the muster two hundred and sixty-two two thousand and more the sioux went into the fight with custer went out of the fight with custer for never a man can say i rode with custer that day went out like a taper blown by a sudden vapor went out at a breath true to the death francis brooks little big horn june twenty five eighteen seventy six beside the lone river that idly lay dreaming flashed sudden the gleaming of sabre and gun in the light of the sun as over the hillside the soldiers came streaming one peal of the bugle in stillness unbroken that sounded a token of soul-stirring strife savage war to the knife then silence that seemed like defiance unspoken but out of an ambush came warriors riding swift ponies bestriding shook rattles and shells with a discord of yells that fired the hearts of their comrades in hiding then fierce on the wigwams the soldiers descended and madly were blended the red man and white in hand-to-hand -hand fight with the indian village assailed and defended and there through the passage of battle-torn spaces from dark lurking places with blood-curdling cry and their knives held on high rushed amazon women with wild painted faces then swung the keen sabres and flashed the shore rifles their message that stifles the shout in red throats all the reckless blue coats laughed on mid the fray as men laugh over trifles grim cavalry troopers unshorn and unshaven and never a craven in ambuscade caught and like demons they fought round the knoll on the prairie that marked their last haven but the sioux circled nearer the shrill war-whoop crying and death hail was flying yet still they fought on till the last shot was gone and all that remained were the dead and the dying a song for their death and no black plumes of sorrow this recompense borrow like heroes they died man to man side by side we lost them to-day we shall meet them to-morrow and on the lone river has faded the seeming of bright armor gleaming but there by the shore with the ghosts of no more the shades of the dead through the ages lie dreaming ernest mcgaffey custer's last charge june twenty five eighteen seventy six dead is it possible he the bold rider custer our hero the first in the fight charming the bullets of yore to fly wider far from our battle king's ringlets of light dead our young chieftain and dead all forsaken no one to tell us the way of his fall slain in the desert and never to waken never not even to victory's call proud for his fame that last day that he met them all the night long he had been on their track scorning their traps and the men that had set them wild for a charge that should never give back there on the hilltop he halted and saw them lodges all loosened and ready to fly hurrying scouts with the tidings to all them told of his coming before he was nigh 
all the wide valley was full of their forces gathered to cover the lodge's retreat warriors running in haste to their horses thousands of enemies close to his feet down in the valleys the ages had hollowed there lay the sitting bull's camp for a prey numbers what wrecked he what wrecked those who followed men who had fought ten to one ere that day outswept the squadrons the fated three hundred into the battle line steady and full then down the hillside exultingly thundered into the hordes of the old sitting bull wild ogalala arapaho cheyenne wild horses braves and the rest of their crew shrank from that charge like a herd from a lion then closed around the grim horde of wild sioux right to their centre he charged and then facing hark to those yells and around them o oh, see over the hilltops the indians come racing coming as fast as the waves of the sea red was the circle of fire around them no hope of victory no ray of light shot through that terrible black cloud without them brooding in death over custer's last fight then did he blench did he die like a craven begging those torturing fiends for his life was there a soldier who carried the seven flinched like a coward or fled from the strife no by the blood of our custer no quailing there in the midst of the indians they close hemmed in by thousands but ever assailing fighting like tigers all bayed amid foes thicker and thicker the bullets came singing down go the horses and riders and all swiftly the warriors round them were ringing circling like buzzards awaiting their fall see the wild steeds of the mountain and prairie savage eyes gleaming from forests of maine quivering lances with pennons so airy were painted warriors charging amain backward again and again they were driven shrinking to close with the lost little band never a cap that had worn the bright seven bowed till its wearer was dead on the strand closer and closer the death circle growing ever the leader's voice clarion clear rang out his words of encouragement glowing we can but die once boys we'll sell our lives dear dearly they sold them like berserkers raging facing the death that encircled them round death's bitter pangs by their vengeance assuaging marking their tracks by their dead on the ground comrades our children shall yet tell their story custer's last charge on the old sitting bull in ages shall swear that the cup of his glory needed but that death to render it full frederick whittaker custer june twenty five eighteen seventy six what shall that sudden blade leap out no more no more thy hand be laid upon the sword hilt smiting sore oh for another such the charger's rein to clutch one equal voice to summon victory sounding thy battle cry brave darling of the soldier's choice would there were one more voice o gallant charge too bold o fierce imperious greed to pierce the clouds that in their darkness hold slaughter of man and steed now stark and cold among thy fallen braves thou liest and even with thy blood defiest the wolfish foe but ah thou liest low and all our birthday song is hushed indeed young lion of the plain thou of the tawny mane hotly the soldiers hearts shall beat their mouths thy death repeat their vengeance seek the trail again where thy red doomsmen be 
but on the charge no more shall stream thy hair no more thy sabre gleam no more ring out thy battle shout thy cry of victory not when a hero falls the sound a world appalls for while we plant his cross there is a glory even in the loss but when some craven heart from honor dares to part then then the groan the blanching cheek and men in whispers speak nor kith nor country dare reclaim from the black depths his name thou wild young warrior rest by all the prairie winds caressed swift was thy dying pang even as the war-cry rang thy deathless spirit mounted high and sought columbia's sky there to the northward far shines a new star and from it blazes down the light of thy renown edmund clarence stedman july tenth eighteen seventy six the indians were led by rain in the face the year before he had been arrested by captain tom custer at standing rock and had threatened to eat the latter's heart the captain was among the killed and rain in the face is said to have made good his threat mr longfellow was mistaken in saying that colonel george custer was thus mutilated his body was not disfigured in any way the revenge of rain in the face june twenty five eighteen seventy six in that desolate land and lone where the big horn and yellow stone roar down their mountain path by their fires the sioux chiefs muttered their woes and griefs and the menace of their wrath revenge cried rain in the face revenge upon all the race of the white chief with yellow hair and the mountains dark and high from their crags re-echoed the cry of his anger and despair in the meadow spreading wide by woodland and riverside the indian village stood all was silent as a dream save the rushing of the stream and the blue jay in the wood in his war-paint and his beads like a bison among the reeds in ambush the sitting bull lay with three thousand braves crouched in the clefts and caves savage unmerciful into the fatal snare the white chief with yellow hair and his three hundred men dashed headlong sword in hand but of that gallant band not one returned again the sudden darkness of death overwhelmed them like the breath and smoke of a furnace fire by the river's bank and between the rocks of the ravine they lay in their bloody attire but the foemen fled in the night and rain in the face in his flight uplifted high in air as a ghastly trophy bore the brave heart that beat no more of the white chief with yellow hair whose was the right and the wrong sing it o funeral song with a voice that is full of tears and say that our broken faith wrought all this ruin and scathe in the year of a hundred years henry wadsworth longfellow one survivor there was and only one comanche the horse ridden by captain miles keogh he was found several miles from the battlefield and had been wounded seven times by order of the secretary of war a soldier was detailed to take care of him as long as he lived and no one was ever afterwards permitted to ride him miles keogh's horse on the bluff of the little big horn at the close of a woeful day Custer and his three hundred in death and silence lay three hundred to three thousand 
they had bravely fought and bled for such is the will of congress when the white man meets the red the white men are ten millions the thriftiest under the sun the reds are fifty thousand and warriors every one so custer and all his fighting men lay under the evening skies staring up at the tranquil heaven with wide accusing eyes and of all that stood at noonday in that fiery scorpion ring miles keogh's horse at evening was the only living thing alone from that field of slaughter where lay the three hundred slain the horse comanche wandered with keogh's blood on his mane and sturgis issued this order which future times shall read while the love and honor of comrades are the soul of the soldier's creed he said let the horse comanche henceforth till he shall die be kindly cherished and cared for by the seventh cavalry he shall do no labor he never shall know the touch of spur or rein nor shall his back be ever crossed by living rider again and at regimental formation of the seventh cavalry comanche draped in mourning and led by a trooper of company one shall parade with the regiment thus it was commanded and thus done by order of general sturgis signed by adjutant garlington even as the sword of custer in his disastrous fall flashed out a blaze that charmed the world and glorified his pall this order issued amid the gloom that shrouds our army's name when all foul beasts are free to rend and tear its honest fame shall prove to a callous people that the sense of a soldier's worth that the love of comrades the honor of arms have not yet perished from earth john hay the government rushed a large force to the scene and finally after painful fighting and toilsome marches stretching over many months the indians were brought to terms rain in the face afterwards professed himself a man of peace and in eighteen eighty six tried to enter hampton institute he was killed during the sioux outbreak in eighteen ninety on the big horn eighteen eighty six the years are but half a score and the war whoop sounds no more with the blast of bugles where straight into a slaughter pen with his doomed three hundred men rode the chief with the yellow hair o oh, hampton down by the sea what voice is beseeching thee for the scholar's lowliest place can this be the voice of him who fought on the big horn's rim can this be rain in the face his war paint is washed away his hands have forgotten to slay he seeks for himself and his race the arts of peace and the lore they give to the skilled hand more than the spoils of war and chase o chief of the christ-like school can the zeal of thy heart grow cool when the victor scarred with fight like a child for thy guidance craves and the faces of hunters and braves are turning to thee for light the hatchet lies overgrown with grass by the yellow stone wind river and paw of bear and in sign that foes are friends each lodge like a peace pipe sends its smoke in the quiet air the hands that have done the wrong to right the wrong it are strong and the voice of a nation saith enough of the war of swords enough of the lying words and shame of a broken faith the hills that have watched afar the valleys ablaze with war shall look on the tasseled corn and the dust of the grinded grain instead of the blood of the slain shall sprinkle thy banks big horn 
the oot and the wandering crow shall know as the white men know and fair as the white men fair the pale and the red shall be brothers one's rights shall be as another's home school and house of prayer o mountains that climb to snow o river winding below through meadows by war once trod o wild waste lands that await the harvest exceeding great break forth into praise of god john greenleaf whittier in eighteen eighty six another somewhat serious uprising took place among the apaches a band of hostiles taking the warpath under the chief geronimo general nelson a miles after a long pursuit succeeded in capturing them the gray horse troop all alone on the hillside larry and barry and me nothing to see but the sky and the plain nothing to see but the driving rain nothing to see but the painted sioux galloping galloping whoop whoroo the devil in yellow is down in the mud says larry to barry i'm losing blood cheers for the greys yells barry second dragoons groans larry hurrah hurrah for egan's gray troop whoop ye devils you've got to whoop cheer for the troopers who die says i cheer for the troop that never shall die all alone on the hillside larry and barry and me flat on our bellies and pourin in lead seven rounds left and the horse is dead barry a cursin at every breath larry beside him as white as death indians galloping galloping by wheelin and squealin like hawks in the sky cheers for the greys yells barry second dragoons groans larry hurrah hurrah for egan's gray troop whoop ye devils you've got to whoop cheer for the troopers who die says i cheer for the troop that never shall die all alone on the hillside larry and barry and me two of us livin and one of us dead shot in the head and god how he bled larry's done up says barry to me divvy his cartridges quick gimme three while nearer and nearer and plainer in view galloped and galloped the murderin sioux cheers for the greys yells barry cheer and he falls on larry alas alas for egan's great troop the red sioux hovering stoop to swoop two out of three lay dead while i cheered for the troop that never shall die all alone on the hillside larry and barry and me and i fired and yelled till i lost my head cheering the livin cheering the dead swinging my cap i cheered until i stumbled and fell then over the hill there floated a trumpeter's silvery call and egan's great troop galloped up that's all drink to the greys and barry second dragoons and larry here's a bumper to egan's great troop let the crape on the guidance droop drink to the troopers who die while i drink to the troop that never shall die robert w chambers geronimo was sent to fort pickens florida where he was kept in captivity for the remainder of his life geronimo beside that tent and under guard in majesty alone he stands as some chained eagle broken winged with eyes that gleam like smouldering brands a savage face streaked o'er with paint and coal-black hair and unkempt mane thin cruel lips set rigidly a red apache tamerlane as restless as the desert winds yet here he stands like carven stone his raven locks by breezes moved and backward o'er his shoulders blown silent 
yet watchful as he waits robed in his strange barbaric guise while here and there go searchingly the cat-like wanderings of his eyes the eagle feather on his head is dull with many a bloody stain while darkly on his lowering brow forever rests the mark of cain have you but seen a tiger caged and sullen through his barriers glare mark well his human prototype the fierce apache fettered there ernest mcgaffey in eighteen eighty nine the territory known as oklahoma was open to settlement and again the indians saw their hunting grounds invaded by the white man while they themselves were compelled to remove to a new reservation sitting bull again advised resistance and was killed while trying to escape arrest a squaw of the tribe made desperate by the removal killed her baby and committed suicide the last reservation sullen and dark in the september day on the bank of the river they waited the boat that would bear them away from their poor homes forever for progress strides on and the order had gone to these wards of the nation give us land and more room was the cry and move on to the next reservation with her babe she looked back at the home neath the trees from which they were driven where the smoke of the last camp-fire borne on the breeze rose slowly toward heaven behind her fair fields and the forest and glade the home of her nation around her the gleam of the bayonet and blade of civilization clasping close to her bosom the small dusky form with tender caressing she bent down on the cheek of her babe soft and warm a mother's kiss pressing there's a splash in the river the column moves on close guarded and narrow with hardly more note of the two that are gone than the fall of a sparrow only an indian wretched obscure to refinement a stranger and a babe that was born in a wigwam as poor and rude as a manger moved on to make room for the growth in the west of a brave christian nation moved on and thank god forever at rest in the last reservation walter learned that was the last of the indian outbreaks although there are still more than two hundred thousand indians in the united states by far the greater part of them have adopted the dress and customs of the white man and are engaged in peaceful occupations the remainder are content to live in idleness upon the government's bounty indian names ye say they all have passed away that noble race and brave that their light canoes have vanished from off the crested wave that mid the forests where they roamed there rings no hunter's shout but their name is on your waters ye may not wash it out tis where ontario's billow like ocean's surge is curled where strong niagara's thunders wake the echo of the world where red missouri bringeth rich tribute from the west and rappahannock sweetly sleeps on green virginia's breast ye say their cone-like cabins that clustered o'er the vale have fled away like withered leaves before the autumn's gale but their memory liveth on your hills their baptism on your shore your everlasting rivers speak their dialect of yore old massachusetts wears it within her lordly crown and broad ohio bears it mid all her young renown connecticut hath wreathed it where her quiet foliage waves and bold kentucky breathes it hoarse 
through all her ancient caves wachusett hides its lingering voice within his rocky heart and allegheny graves its tone throughout his lofty chart monadonic on his forehead hoar doth seal the sacred trust your mountains build their monument though ye destroy their dust lydia huntley sigourney end of section three recording by greg giordano newport ritchie florida Chapter 4, Part 1 of Poems of American History, Volume 5, The Period of Expansion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Philip Gould. Poems of American History, Volume 5, The Period of Expansion, by Various. Chapter 4, Part 1. Chapter 4. The Second Assassination On the fourth day of March, 1881, James Abram Garfield, Republican, was inaugurated President of the United States. He had served with distinction in the Civil War and afterwards in Congress, and seemed destined to enjoy a peaceful and prosperous administration. But on July the 1st, he was shot down at Washington by Charles J. Guiteau, a half-crazed, disappointed office-seeker. The President fought manfully for life, but blood poisoning developed and death followed on September 19th. Rejoice! Bear me out of the battle, for lo, I am sorely wounded. From out my deep, wide-bosomed west, where unnamed heroes hew the way for worlds to follow, with stern zest, where gnarled old maples make a ray deep scarred from red men gone to rest, where pipes the quail, where squirrels play through tossing trees with nuts for toy, a boy steps forth, clear-eyed and tall, a bashful boy, a soulful boy, yet comely as the sons of Saul, a boy all friendless, poor, unknown, yet heir apparent to a throne. Lo, freedom's bleeding sacrifice! So like some tall oak tempest-blown beside the storied stream he lies now at the last, pale-browed and prone. A nation kneels with streaming eyes. A nation supplicates the throne. A nation holds him by the hand. A nation sobs aloud at this. The only dry eyes in the land now at the last, I think, are his. Why? We should pray, God knoweth best, that this grand, patient soul should rest. The world is round, the wheel has run full circle. Now behold a grave beneath the old love trees is done. The druid oaks slipped up and wave a solemn welcome back. The brave old maples murmur every one, receive him, earth. In center land as in the center of each heart, as in the hollow of God's hand the coffin sinks. And with it part all party hates. Now not in vain he bore his peril and hard pain. Therefore, I say, rejoice. I say the lesson of his life was much, this boy that won as in a day the world's heart utterly, a touch of tenderness and tears, the page of history grows rich from such. His name the nation's heritage. But, oh, as some sweet angel's voice spake this brave death that touched us all. Therefore, I say, rejoice, Rejoice, run high the flags, put by the pall. Lo, all is for the best, for all. Joaquin Miller The Bells at Midnight, September 19, 1881 In their dark house of cloud the three weird sisters toil till time be sped. One unwinds life, one ever weaves the shroud, one waits to part the thread. Clotho how long, O oh sister, how long ere the weary task is done? How long, O oh sister, how long shall the fragile thread be spun? Lachesis, tis mercy that stays her hand, else she had cut the thread. 
She is a woman, too, like her who kneels by his bed. Atropos. Patience. The end is come, he shall no more endure. See with a single touch, my hand is swift and sure. Two angels pausing in their flight. First angel. Listen. What was it fell an instant ago on my ear? A sound like the throb of a bell from yonder darkling sphere. Second angel, the planet where mortals dwell. I hear it not. Yes, I hear. How it deepens, a sound of dole. Listen, it is the knell of a passing soul, the midnight lamentation of some stricken nation for a chieftain's soul. It has just begun, the many-throated moan. Now the clangor swells as if a million bells had blent their tones in one. Accents of despair are these to mortal ear, but all this wild funereal music blown and sifted through celestial air turns to triumphant peons here. Wave upon wave the silvery anthems flow, wave upon wave the deep vibrations roll from that dim sphere below. Come, let us go, surely some chieftain's soul. Thomas Bailey Aldrich J. A. G. Our sorrow sends its shadow round the earth, so brave, so true, a hero from his birth. The plumes of empire molt in mourning draped, the lightning's message by our tears is shaped. Life's vanities that blossom for an hour heap on his funeral car their fleeting flower. Commerce forsakes her temples, blind and dim, and pours her tardy gold to homage him. The notes of grief to age familiar grow before the sad privations all must know, but the majestic cadence which we hear today is new in either hemisphere. What crown is this, high hung and hard to reach, whose glory so outshines our laboring speech? The crown of honor, pure and unbetrayed, he wins the spurs who bears the knightly aid. While royal babes incipient empire hold, and, for bare promise, grasp the scepter's gold, this man such service to his age did bring, that they who knew him servant hailed him king. In poverty his infant couch was spread, his tender hand soon wrought for daily bread, but from the cradles bound his willing feet the errand of the moment went to meet. When learning's page unfolded to his view, the quick disciple straight a teacher grew. And when the fight of freedom stirred the land, armed was his heart, and resolute his hand. Wise in the council, stalwart in the field, such rank supreme a workman's hut may yield. His onward steps like measured marbles show, climbing the height where God's great flame doth glow. Ah, rose of joy that hits a thorn so sharp, Ah, golden woof that meets to severed warp! Ah, solemn comfort that the stars rain down! The hero's garland his, the martyr's crown. Julia Ward Howe Midnight, September 19, 1881 Once in a lifetime we may see the veil tremble and lift that hides symbolic things. The spirit's vision, when the senses fail, sweeps the weird meaning that the outlook brings. Deep in the midst of turmoil it may be, a crowded street, a forum, or a field. The soul inverts the telescope to see today's events in future's years revealed. Back from the present let us look at Rome. Behold what Cato meant, what Brutus said. Hark the Athenians welcome Simon home. How clear they are, those glimpses of the dead. But we hard toilers, we who plan and weave through common days the web of common life, what word, alas, shall teach us to receive the mystic meaning of our peace and strife? Whence comes our symbol? Surely God must speak, no less than He can make us heed or pause. Self-seekers we, too busy or too weak to search beyond our daily lives and laws. From things occult our earth-turned eyes rebel, no sound of destiny can reach our ears. We have no time for dreaming. Hark! A knell. A knell at midnight. All the nation hears. A second grievous throb. The dreamers wake. The merchant soul forgets his goods and ships. The weary workmen from their slumbers break. 
the women raise their eyes with quivering lips. The miner rests upon his pick to hear. The printer's type stops midway from the case. The solemn sound has reached the roisterer's ear and brought the shame and sorrow to his face. Again it booms. O mystic veil upraise! Behold, tis lifted. On the darkness drawn a picture lined with light. The people's gaze from sea to sea beholds it till the dawn. A deathbed scene. A sinking sufferer lies, their chosen ruler crowned with love and pride, around his counsellors with streaming eyes, his wife heartbroken kneeling by his side. Death shadow holds her. It will pass too soon. She weeps in silence, bitterest of tears. He wanders softly, nature's kindest boon, and as he murmurs all the country hears. For him the pain is past. The struggle ends, his cares and honors fade, his younger life in peaceful mentor comes with dear old friends, his mother's arms take home his dear young wife. He stands among the students, tall and strong, and teaches truths republican and grand. He moves, ah, pitiful, he sweeps along o'er fields of carnage, leading his command. He speaks to crowded faces. Round him surge thousands and millions of excited men. He hears them cheer, sees some vast light emerge, is borne as on a tempest. Then, ah, then, the fancies fade. The fever's work is past. A deepening pang, then recollections thrill. He feels the faithful lips that kiss their last. His heart beats once in answer and is still. The curtain falls but hushed, as if afraid. The people wait, tear-stained, with heaving breast. T'will rise again, they know, when he is laid with freedom in the capital, at rest. John Boyle O'Reilly For two days, September 22nd and 23rd, the body lay in state in the rotunda of the capital. Then, in a long train crowded with the most illustrious of his countrymen, the dead president was born to Cleveland, Ohio, and buried on September 26th, in a beautiful cemetery overlooking the waters of Lake Erie. At the President's Grave All summer long the people knelt and listened at the sick man's door. Each pang which that pale sufferer felt throbbed through the land from shore to shore. And as the all-dreaded hour drew nigh, what breathless watching, night and day, what tears, what prayers, great God on high, have we forgotten how to pray? O broken-hearted, widowed one, forgive us if we press too near. Dead is our husband, father, son, for we are all one household here. And not alone here by the sea, and not in his own land alone, are tears of anguish shed with thee. In this one loss, the world is one. Epitaph. A man not perfect, but of heart so high, of such heroic rage that even his hopes became a part of earth's eternal heritage. Richard Watson Gilder The public rage against the assassin knew no bounds. Only by the utmost vigilance was his life saved from the attacks upon it. He was brought to trial and found guilty of murder in January 1882, and was executed June 30th. On the Death of President Garfield Fallen with autumn's falling leaf, ere yet his summer's noon was past, Our friend, our guide, our trusted chief, What words can match a woe so vast? And who's the chartered claim to speak the sacred grief Where all have part, where sorrow saddens every cheek And broods in every aching heart? Yet nature prompts the burning phrase that thrills the hushed and shrouded hall, The loud lament, the sorrowing praise, the silent tear that love lets fall. In loftiest verse, in lowliest rhyme, shall strive unblame the minstrel choir, the singers of the newborn time, and trembling age without worn lyre. No room for pride, no place for blame, we fling our blossoms on the grave, pale, scentless, faded. All we claim, this only, what we had, we gave. Ah, could the grief of all who mourn blend in one voice its bitterest cry, the wail to heaven's high arches borne would echo through the cavern sky. O happiest land whose peaceful choice fills with a breath its empty throne, 
God, speaking through thy people's voice, has made that voice, for once, his own. No angry passion shakes the state whose weary servant seeks for rest, and who could fear that scowling hate would strike at that unguarded breast? He stands, unconscious of his doom in manly strength, erect, serene. Around him summer spreads her bloom. He falls. What horror clothes the scene? How swift the sudden flash of woe where all was bright as childhood's dream, as if from heaven's ethereal bow had leaped the lightning's arrowy gleam. Blot the foul deed from history's page. Let not the all-betraying sun blush for the day that stains an age when murder's blackest wreath was won. Pale on his couch the sufferer lies, the weary battleground of pain. Love tends his pillow. Science tries her every art, alas, in vain. The strife endures. How long? How long? Life, death, seem balanced in the scale, while round his bed a viewless throng await each morrow's changing tale. In realms the desert ocean parts, what myriads watch with tear-filled eyes, his pulse beats echoing in their hearts, his breathings counted with their sighs. Slowly the stores of life are spent, yet hope still battles with despair. Will heaven not yield when knees are bent? Answer, O thou who hearest prayer. But silent is the brazen sky. On sweeps the meteor's threatening train, unswerving nature's mute reply, bound in her adamantine chain. Not ours the verdict to decide whom death shall claim or skill shall save. The hero's life, though heaven denied, it gave our land a martyr's grave. Nor count the teaching vainly sent, how human hearts their griefs may share. The lesson woman's love is lent, what hope may do, what faith can bear. Farewell, the leaf-strown earth enfolds our stay, our pride, our hopes, our fears. And autumn's golden sun beholds a nation bowed, a world in tears. Oliver Wendell Holmes President Garfield I vini dal martirio a questa pace Paradiso, 15, 148 These words the poet heard in Paradise uttered by one who, bravely dying here in the true faith, was living in that sphere where the celestial cross of sacrifice spread its protecting arms athwart the skies, and set thereon, like jewels crystal clear the soul's magnanimous, that knew not fear, flashed their effulgence on his dazzled eyes. Ah, me, how dark the discipline of pain were not the suffering followed by the sense of infinite rest and infinite release. This is our consolation, and again a great soul cries to us in our suspense, I came from martyrdom unto this peace. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow the hundredth anniversary of the surrender of the British at Yorktown was celebrated on October 19, 1881. The lyric for the occasion was written by Paul Hamilton Haney. Yorktown Centennial Lyric, October 19, 1881. Hark, hark down the centuries long reaching slope to those transports of triumph, those raptures of hope, the voices of Maine and of mountain combined in glad resonance borne on the wings of the wind, the bass of the drum and the trumpet that thrills through the multiplied echoes of jubilant hills. And mark how the years, melting upward like mist, which the breath of some splendid enchantment is kissed, reveal on the ocean, reveal on the shore, the proud pageant of conquest that graced them of yore, when blended forever in love is in fame, See the standard which stole from the starlight its flame, and type of all chivalry, glory, romance, the lilies, the luminous lilies of France. O oh, stubborn the strife ere the conflict was won, and the wild whirling war rack half stifled the sun, the thunders of cannon that boomed on the lee, but re-echoed far thunders pealed up from the sea, where guarding his sea lists a night on the waves, Bold de Grasse kept at bay the bluff bulldogs of graves. The day turned to darkness, the night changed to fire, still more fierce waxed the combat, more deadly the ire undimmed by the gloom, in majestic advance. O oh, behold where they ride o'er the red battle-tide, those banners united in love as in fame. 
the brave standard which drew from the star-beams their flame and type of all chivalry glory romance the lilies the luminous lilies of france no respite no pause by the york's tortured flood the grim lion of england is writhing in blood cornwallis may chafe and coarse tarleton aver as he sharpens his broadsword and buckles his spur this blade which so often has reaped rebels like grain shall now harvest for death the rude yeoman again vain boast for ere sunset he's flying in fear with the rebels he scouted close close in his rear while the french on his flank hurl such volleys of shot that even gloucester's redoubt must be growing too hot thus wedded in love as united in fame lo the standard which stole from the starlight its flame and type of all chivalry glory romance the lilies the luminous lilies of france o morning superb when the siege reached its close see the sun dawn out bloom like the alchemist rose the last wreaths of smoke from dim trenches upcurled are transformed to a glory that smiles on the world joy joy save the wan wasted front of the foe with his battle flags furled and his arms trailing low respect for the brave in stern silence they yield and in silence they pass with bowed heads from the field then triumph transcendent so titan of tone that some vowed it must startle king george on his throne when peace to her own timed the pulse of the land and the war weapon sank from the war wearied hand young freedom upborne to the height of the goal she had yearned for so long with deep travail of soul a song of her future raised thrilling and clear till the woods leaned to hearken the hill slopes to hear yet fraught with all magical grandeurs that gleam on the hero's high hope or the patriot's dream what future though bright in cold shadow so cast the proud beauty that halos the brow of the past o wedded in love as united in fame see the standard which stole from the starlight its flame and type of all chivalry glory romance the lilies the luminous lilies of france paul hamilton haney on may twenty fourth eighteen eighty three the great bridge spanning the east river and connecting brooklyn with new york city was open to the public having been thirteen years in process of construction the brooklyn bridge may twenty fourth eighteen eighty three a granite cliff on either shore a highway poised in air above the wheels of traffic roar below the fleets sail fair and in and out forevermore the surging tides of ocean pour and past the towers the white gulls soar and winds the sea clouds bear o peerless this majestic street this road that leaps the brine upon its heights twin cities meet and throng its grand incline to east to west with swiftest feet though ice may crash and billows beat though blinding fogs the waves may greet or golden summer shine sail up the bay with morning's beam or rocky hellgate by its columns rise its cables gleam great tents athwart the sky and lone it looms august supreme when with the splendor of a dream its blazing cressets gild the stream till evening shadows fly by nile stand proud the pyramids but they were for the dead the awful gloom that joy forbids the mourners silent tread the crypt the coffin stony lids sad is a soul the maze that threads of dark amenti ere it rids its way of judgment dread this glorious arch these climbing towers are all for life and cheer part of the new world's nobler dowers hint of millennial year that comes apace though evil lowers when loftier aims and larger powers will mould and deck this earth of ours and heaven at length bring near unmoved its cliffs shall crown the shore its arch the chasm dare its network hang the blue before as gossamer in air while in and out forevermore the surging tides of ocean pour and past its towers the white gulls soar and winds the sea clouds bear edna dean proctor brooklyn bridge no lifeless thing of iron and stone but sentient as her children are nature accepts you for her own kin to the cataract and the star she marks your vast sufficing plan cable and girder 
bolt and rod, and takes you from the hand of man for some new handiwork of God. You thrill through all your cords of steel, responsive to the living sun, and quickening in your nerves you feel life with its conscious currents run. Your anchorage upbears the march of time and the eternal powers. The sky admits your perfect arch. The rock respects your stable towers. Charles G. D. Roberts The first week in September, 1886, a destructive earthquake shook the eastern portion of the United States, Charleston, South Carolina, suffering a tremendous shock which snuffed out scores of lives and rendered seven-eighths of the houses unfit for habitation. Charleston, 1886 Is this the price of beauty? Fairest thou of all the cities of the sunrise sea, yet thrice thou art stricken. First war harried thee, then the dread circling tempest drove its plough right through thy palaces, and now, oh now, a sound of terror, and thy children flee into the night and death. O oh, deity, thou god of war and whirlwind, whose dark brow frowning makes tremble sea and solid land, these are thy creatures who to heaven cry while hell roars neath them and its portals ope. To thee they call, to thee who bids them die who hast forgotten to withhold thy hand, for thou, destroyer, art man's only hope. Richard Watson Gilder On September ninth and eleventh, 1886, the American yacht Mayflower defeated the English yacht Galatea in the international races for the America's Cup. Mayflower Thunder our thanks to her, guns, hearts, and lips. Cheer from the ranks to her, shout from the banks to her, Mayflower, foremost and best of our ships. Mayflower, twice in the national story thy dear name in letters of gold, woven in texture that never grows old, winning a home and winning glory. Sailing the years to us welcome for a, cherished for centuries dearest today. Every heart throbs for her, every flag dips, Mayflower, first and last, best of our ships. White as a seagull she swept the long passage, true as the homing bird flies with its message. Love her? Oh, richer than silk every sail of her. Trust her? More precious than gold every nail of her. Write we down faithfully every man's part in her, greet we all gratefully every true heart in her more than a name to us, sailing the fleetest symbol of that which is purest and sweetest, more than a keel to us, steering the straightest, emblem of that which is freest and greatest, more than a dove bosom sail to the windward, flame passing on while night clouds fly hindward, kiss every plank of her, none shall take rank of her, frontward or weatherward none can eclipse, Thunder our thanks to her, cheer from the banks to her, Mayflower, foremost and best of our ships. John Boyle O'Reilly On October 28, 1886, Bartholdi's Statue of Liberty Enlightening the World, a gift to America from the people of France, was unveiled on Bedloe's Island in New York Harbor. Fairest of Freedom's Daughters Read at the dedication of the Bartholdi Statue, New York Harbor, October 28, 1886. Night's diadem around thy head, the world upon thee gazing, beneath the eye of Harrow's dead thy queenly form upraising. Lift up, lift up thy torch on high, fairest of freedom's daughters, flash it across thine own blue sky, flash it across the waters. Stretch up to thine own woman's height thine eye lit with truth's luster, as though from God, himself a light, Earth's hopes around thee cluster. The stars touch with thy forehead fair, At them thy torch was lighted. They grope to find where truth's ways are, The nations long benighted. Thou hast the van in earth's proud march, To thee all nations turning. Thy torch against thine own blue arch, In answer to their yearning. Show them the pathway thou hast trod, The chains which thou hast broken. Teach them thy trust in man and God, the watchwords thou hast spoken. Not here is heard the Alp herd's horn, the mountain stillness breaking. 
nor do we catch the roseate morn the alpine summits waking is necker's vale no longer fair that german hearts are leaving ah german hearts from hearthstones tear in thy proud star believing has Rhineland lost her grapes perfume, her waters green and golden, and do her castles no more bloom with legends rare and olden? Why leave strong men the fatherland? Why cross the cold blue ocean? Truce torch in thine uplifted hand, ha, kindles their devotion. God, home, and country be thy care, thou queen of all the ages. Belting the earth is this one prayer, unspotted be thy pages. Lift up, lift up thy torch on high, fairest of freedom's daughters. Flash it against thine own blue sky. Flash it against the waters. Jeremiah Eames Rankin Liberty Enlightening the World Warden at ocean's gate, thy feet on sea and shore. Like one the skies await when time shall be no more. What splendors crown thy brow? What bright dread angel thou dazzling the waves before thy station great? My name is Liberty. From out a mighty land I face the ancient sea. I lift to God my hand. By day in heaven's light, a pillar of fire by night. At ocean's gate I stand nor bend the knee. The dark earth lay in sleep, her children crouched forlorn. Ere on the western steep I sprang to height, reborn. Then what a joyous shout the quickened lands gave out, and all the choir of morn sang anthems deep. Beneath yon firmament the new world to the old my sword and summons sent, my azure flag unrolled. The old world's hands renew their strength, the form ye view came from a living mold and glory blent. O ye whose broken spars tell of the storms ye met, enter, fear not the bars across your pathway set. Enter at freedom's porch, for you I lift my torch, for you my coronet is rayed with stars, but ye that hither draw to desecrate my fee, nor yet have held in awe the justice that makes free, avaunt ye darkling brood, by right my house hath stood, my name is liberty, my throne is law, O wonderful and bright immortal freedom hail front in thy fiery might the midnight and the gale undaunted on this base guard well thy dwelling place till the last sun grow pale let there be light edmund clarence stedman the bartholdi statue eighteen eighty six the land that from the rule of kings in freeing us itself made free our old world sister to us brings her sculptured dream of liberty Unlike the shapes on Egypt's sands, uplifted by the toil-worn slave, on freedom's soil, with free men's hands, we rear the symbol free hands gave. O France the beautiful, to thee once more a debt of love we owe. In peace beneath thy colors three we hail a later Rochambeau. Rise, stately symbol, holding forth thy light and hope to all who sit in chains and darkness. Belt the earth with watchfires from thy torch uplit. Reveal the primal mandate still, which chaos heard and ceased to be. Trace on mid-air the eternal will and signs of fire. Let man be free. Shine far, shine free, a guiding light to reason's ways and virtue's aim. A lightning flash, the wretch to smite, who shields his license with thy name. John Greenleaf Whittier End of Chapter 4, Part 1 of Poems of American History, Volume 5, The Period of Expansion. Recording by Philip Gould. Chapter 4, Part 2 of Poems of American History, Volume 5, The Period of Expansion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Philip Gould. Poems of American History, Volume 5. The Period of Expansion by Various. Chapter 4, Part 2. 
On September 18, 1887, the 100th anniversary of the adoption of the Constitution of the United States was suitably observed at Philadelphia. President Grover Cleveland, Justice Samuel Freeman Miller, and John Adams Casson delivered addresses, and the new Hail Columbia was sung by a chorus of 2,000 voices. Additional Verses to Hail Columbia Written at the request of the Committee for the Constitutional Centennial Celebration at Philadelphia, 1887. Look our ransom shores around. Peace and safety we have found. Welcome, friends, who once were foes. Welcome, friends, who once were foes, to all the conquering years have gained. A nation's rights, a race unchained. Children of the day newborn, mindful of its glorious morn. Let the pledge our fathers signed heart to heart forever bind while the stars of heaven shall burn while the ocean tides return ever may the circling sun find the many still are one graven deep with edge of steel crowned with victory's crimson seal all the world their name shall read all the world their name shall read enrolled with his the chief that led the hosts whose blood for us was shed pay our sires their children's debt love and honor nor forget only union's golden key guards the ark of liberty while the stars of heaven shall burn while the ocean tides return ever may the circling sun find the many still are one hail columbia strong and free throned in hearts from sea to sea thy march triumphant still pursue Thy march triumphant still pursue with peaceful stride from zone to zone till freedom finds the world her own. Blessed in union's holy ties, let our grateful song arise, every voice its tribute lend, all in loving chorus blend. While the stars in heaven shall burn, while the ocean tides return, ever shall the circling sun find the many still are one. Oliver Wendell Holmes. Following this came the recital by James Edward Murdoch of the new national hymn, the Marine Band leading the people and the singers in the chorus. New National Hymn Hail Freedom! Thy bright crest and gleaming shield, thrice blessed, mirror the glories of a world thine own. Hail, heaven-born peace! Our sight, led by thy gentle light, shows us the paths with deathless flowers strown. Peace, daughter of a strife sublime, abide with us, till strife be lost in endless time. Chorus, thy sun is risen, and shall not set upon thy day divine. Ages of unborn ages yet, America, are thine. Her one hand seals with gold the portals of night's fold, her other the broad gates of dawn unbars. O'er silent waste of snows, crowning her lofty brows, gleams high her diadem of northern stars. While clothed in garlands of warm flowers, round freedom's feet, the south, her wealth of beauty showers. Sweet is the toil of peace, sweet is the year's increase to loyal men who live by freedom's laws. And in war's fierce alarms, God gives stout hearts and arms to freemen sworn to save a rightful cause. Fear none, trust God, maintain the right, and triumph in unbroken union's might. Welded in war's fierce flame, forged on the hearth of fame, the sacred constitution was ordained. Tried in the fire of time, tempered in woes sublime, an age was passed and left it yet unstained. God grant its glory still may shine, while ages fade, forgotten, in time's slow decline. Honor the few who shared freedom's first fight, and dared to face war's desperate tide at the full flood, who fell on hard-won ground, and into freedom's womb poured the sweet balsam of their brave heart's blood. They fell, but o'er that glorious grave floats free the banner of the cause they died to save. In radiance heavenly fair floats on the peaceful air that flag that never stooped from victory's pride. Those stars that softly gleam, those stripes that o'er us stream in war's grand agony were sanctified. A holy standard, pure and free, to light the home of peace or blaze in victory. 
Father, whose mighty power shields us through life's short hour, to thee we pray. Bless us and keep us free, all that is past forgive. Teach us henceforth to live, that, through our country, we may honor thee. And when this mortal life shall cease, take thou at last our souls to thine eternal peace. Francis Marion Crawford On March 15, 1889, a destructive hurricane visited the Samoan Islands. There were in the harbor of Appia at the time one English, three German, and three American warships, sent there to safeguard the interest of their respective countries. The English ship, the Calliope, succeeded in steaming out of the harbor, the crew of the American flagship Trenton cheering her as she passed. The Trenton was wrecked a few minutes later, as were the five other ships in the harbor, in Appia Bay. Morituri vos salutimus. Ruin and death held sway that night in Appia Bay, and smote amid the loud and dreadful gloom. But hearts no longer weep the salt unresting sleep of the great dead, victorious in their doom. Vain, vain the straight retreat that held the fated fleet, trapped in the twofold thread of sea and shore. Fell reefs on either hand, and the devouring strand, above, below the tempest deafening roar. What mortal hand shall write the horror of that night, the desperate struggle in that deadly close? The yelling of the blast, the wild surf, white, aghast, the whelming seas, the thunder in the throes. How the great cables surged, the giant engines urged as the brave ships the unequal strife waged on. Not hope, not courage flagged, but the vain anchors dragged down on the reefs they shattered and were gone. And now were wrought the deeds whereof each soul that reads grows manlier and burns with prouder breath. Heroic brotherhood, the loving bonds of blood, proclaim from high hearts face to face with death. At length the English ship, her cables had let slip, crowded all steam and steered for the open sea. Resolved to challenge fate, to pass the perilous strait, and wrench from jaws of ruin victory. With well-tried metal strained, in the storm's teeth she gained, foot by slow foot made head and crept toward life. Across her dubious way the good ship Trenton lay, helpless, but thrilled to watch the splendid strife. Helmless she lay, her bulk a blind and wallowing hulk, by her strained housers only held from wreck. But dauntless each brave heart played his immortal part in strong endurance on the reeling deck. They fought fate inch by inch, could die but could not flinch, and biding the inevitable doom, they marked the English ship, baffling the tempest grip, forge hardly forth from the expected tomb. Then with exultant breath these heroes, waiting death, thundered across the storm a peal of cheers, to the triumphant brave, a greeting from the grave, whose echo shall go ringing down the years. To you who well have won, from us whose courses run, glad greeting as we face the undreaded end. The memory of those cheers shall thrill in English ears, where'er this English blood and speech extend. No manlier deed comes down, blazoned in broad renown, from men of old who live to dare and die. The old fire yet survives here in our modern lives of splendid chivalry and valor high. Charles George Douglas Roberts An International Episode, March 15, 1889 We were ordered to Samoa from the coast of Panama, and for two long months we sailed the unequal sea. Till we made the horseshoe harbor with its curving coral bar, smelt the good green smell of grass and shrub and tree. We had barely room for swinging with the tide. There were many of us crowded in the bay, three Germans and the English ship beside our three. And from the Trenton, where she lay, through the sunset calms and after, we could hear the shrill sweet laughter of the children's voices on the shore at play. We all knew a storm was coming, but, dear God, no man could dream of the furious hell horrors of that day. Through the roar of winds and waters we could hear wild voices scream, see the rocking mast reel by us through the spray. In the gale we drove and drifted helplessly, with our rudder gone our engine fires drowned, 
and none might hope another hour to see for all the air was desperate with the sound of the brave ships rent asunder of the shrieking souls sucked underneath the waves where many a good man's grave was found about noon upon our quarter from the deeper gloom afar came the english man-of-war calliope we have lost our anchors comrades and though small the chances are we must steer for safety in the open sea then we climbed aloft to cheer her as she passed through the tempest and the blackness and the foam now god speed you though the shout should be our last through the channel where the maddening breakers comb through the wild seas hill and hollow on the path we cannot follow to your women and your children and your home oh remember it good brothers we two people speak one tongue and your native land was mother to our land but the head perhaps is hasty when the nation's heart is young and we prate of things we do not understand but the day when we stood face to face with death upon whose face few men may look and tell as long as you could hear or we had breath four hundred voices cheered you out of hell by the will of that stern chorus by the motherland which bore us judge if we do not love each other well carolyn dewar on may thirty first eighteen eighty nine western pennsylvania was visited by one of the worst catastrophes in the history of the country a flood from a broken reservoir overwhelmed johnstown conemaugh and a number of smaller towns destroying over two thousand lives and property to the value of ten million dollars by the conemaugh may thirty first eighteen eighty nine foreboding sudden of untoward change a tightening clasp on everything held dear a moan of waters wild and strange a whelming horror near and midst the thunderous din a voice of dune make way for me o life for death make room i come like the whirlwind rude gainst all thou hast cherished warring i come like the flaming flood from a crater's mouth outpouring i come like the avalanche gliding free and the power that sends thee forth sends me where thou hast builded with strength secure my hand shall spread disaster where thou hast barred me with forethought sure shall ruin flow the faster i come to gather where thou hast sowed but i claim of thee nothing thou hast not owed on my mission of mercy forth i go where the lord of being sends me his will is the only will i know and my strength is the strength he lends me thy loved ones i hide neath my waters dim but i cannot hide them away from him florence earl coates the reservoir was known to be weak and the people below had been warned of the danger yet remained where they were when just before the break engineer john g park galloped down the valley shouting to all to run for their lives it was too late the man who rode to conemaugh may thirty first eighteen eighty nine into the town of conemaugh striking the people's souls with awe dashed a rider aflame and pale never alighting to tell his tale sitting his big bay horse astride run for your lives to the hills he cried run to the hills was what he said as he waved his hand and dashed ahead run for your lives to the hills he cried spurring his horse whose reeking side was flecked with foam as red as flame whither he goes and whence he came nobody knows they see his horse plunging on in his frantic course veins distended and nostrils wide fired and frenzied at such a ride nobody knows the rider's name dead forever to earthly fame run to the hills to the hills he cried run for your lives to the mountain side stop him he's mad just look at him go tain't safe they said to let him ride so he thinks he can scare us said one with a laugh but conemaugh folks don't swallow no chaff tain't nothing i'll bet but that same old leak in the dam above the south fork creek blind to their danger callous of dread they laughed as he left them and dashed ahead run for your lives to the hills he cried lashing his horse in his desperate ride down through the valley the rider passed shouting and spurring his horse on fast but not so fast did the rider go as the raging roaring 
mighty flow of the million feet and the millions more of water whose fury he fled before on he went and on it came the flood itself a very flame of surging swirling seething tide mountain high and torrents wide god alone might measure the force of the conemaugh flood in its v-shaped course behind him were buried under the flood conemaugh town and all who stood jeering there at the man who cried run for your lives to the mountain side on he sped in his fierce wild ride run to the hills to the hills he cried nearer nearer raged the roar horse and rider fled before dashing along the valley ridge they came at last to the railroad bridge the big horse stood the rider cried run for your lives to the mountain side then plunged across but not before the mighty merciless mountain roar struck the bridge and swept it away like a bit of straw or a wisp of hay but over and under and through that tide the voice of the unknown rider cried run to the hills to the hills it cried run for your lives to the mountainside john elliot bowen it is said that another hero named daniel periton rode in front of the flood giving warning and was finally caught by it and drowned a ballad of the conemaugh flood may thirty first eighteen eighty nine the windows of heaven were open wide the storm cloud broke and the people cried will the conemaugh dam hold out but the great folks down at johnstown played they ate they drank they were not afraid for conemaugh dam holds conemaugh lake by conemaugh dam their pleasure they take fine catching our conemaugh trout the four-mile lake at the back of its wall is growing to five and the rain still fall and the flood by night and by day is burrowing deep through buttress and mound fresh water spring and spurt from the ground while god is thundering out of his cloud the fountain voices are crying aloud away to the hills away away to the hills leave altar and shrine away to the hills leave table and wine away from the trade and your tills let the strong man speed with the weakest child and the mother who just on her babe has smiled be carried leave only the dead on their biers no time for the tomb and no time for tears away away to the hills daniel periton heard the wail of the waters gathering over the vale with sorrow for city and field felt already the mountain quake twixt living and dead for the brethren's sake daniel periton dared to ride full in front of the threatening tide and what if the dam do yield to a man it is given but once to die Though the flood break forth, he will raise his cry for the thousands there in the town. At least some child may be saved by his voice. Some lover may still in the sun rejoice. Some man that has fled when he wins his breath shall bless the rider who rode through death, for his fellow's life gave his own. He leapt to his horse that was black as night. He turned not left and he turned not right. Down to the valley he dashed he heard behind him a thunderous boom the dam had burst and he knew his doom fly fly for your lives it was all he spoke fly fly for the conemaugh dam has broke and the cataract after him crashed they saw a man with the god in his face pale from the desperate whirlwind pace they heard an angel cry and the steed's black mane was flecked as he flew and its flanks were red with the spurs red dew into the city and out of the gate rider and ridden were racing with fate wild with one agony flash on the news that the dam is burst and one looked forth and she knew the worst my last message she said the words at her will flashed on before periton's call and the torrent's roar and not in vain had periton cried his heart had caught a brave heart to his side as bold for the saving he sped the flood came down and its strong arms took the city and all together shook tower and church and street like a pack of cards that a player may crush the houses fell in the whirlpool rush rose and floated and jammed at the last then a fierce flame fed by the deluge blast wove them a winding sheet god have mercy was ever a pyre lit like that of the flood's fierce fire cattle and men caught fast prisoners held between life and death while the flame struck down with its sulphurous breath and the flood struck up with its strong cold hand no hope from the water 
no help from the land, and torrent thundering past. Daniel Periton, still he rides, by the heaving flank and the shortening strides, the race must be well nigh won. Away to the hills, but the cataract's bound has caught and has dashed him from saddle to ground, and the man who saw the end of the race saw a dark dead horse and a pale dead face. Did they hear heaven's great well done? Hardwick Drummond Ronsley In charge of the telegraph office at Johnstown was a Mrs. Ogle. She stayed at her post, sending message after message of warning down the valley until she herself was overwhelmed and swept away. Konama Fly to the mountain, fly, terribly rang the cry. The electric soul of the wire quivered like sentient fire. The soul of the woman who stood face to face with the flood answered to the shock like the eternal rock. For she stayed, with her hand on the wire, unafraid, flashing the wild word down into the lower town. Is there a lower yet, and another? Into the valley she and none other can hurl the warning cry. Fly to the mountain, fly! The water from Konama has opened its awful jaw. The dam is wide on the mountainside. Fly for your life, O oh fly, they said. She lifted her noble head. I can stay at my post and die. Face to face with duty and death, dear is the drawing of human breath. Steady, my hand, hold fast to the trust upon thee cast. Steady, my wire, go, say that death is on the way. Steady, strong wire, go, save. Grand is the power you have. Grander the soul that can stand behind the trembling hand. Grander the woman who dares, glory her high name wears. This message is my last shot over the wire and passed to the listening ear of the land. The mountain and the strand reverberate the cry. Fly for your lives, O oh fly. I stay at my post and die. The torrent took her. God knows all. Fiercely the savage currents fall to muttering calm. Men count their dead. The June sky smileth overhead. God's will we neither read nor guess. Poorer by one, more hero, less. We bow the head and clasp the hand. Teach us, although we die, to stand. Elizabeth Stuart Phelps Ward on May 1, 1893, the most remarkable exposition ever held in America opened at Chicago to celebrate the 400th anniversary of the discovery of America. The group of exposition buildings soon became known as the White City. The White City Greece was, Greece is no more. Temple and town have crumbled down, time is the fire that hath consumed them all. Statue and wall in ruin strow the universal floor. Greece lives, but Greece no more. Its ashes breed the undying seed blown westward, till in Rome's imperial towers Athens reflowers. Still westward, lo, a veiled and virgin shore. Say not Greece is no more. Through the clear morn on light winds borne, her white-winged soul sinks on the new world's breast. Ah, happy west, Greece flowers anew and all her temples soar. One bright hour, then no more shall to the skies these columns rise. But though art's flower shall fade, again the seed onward shall speed, quickening the land from lake to ocean's roar. Art lives, though Greece may never from the ancient mold, as once of old, exhale to heaven the inimitable bloom. Yet from that tomb, beauty walks forth to light the world forever. Richard Watson Gilder On February 2, 1894, the famous old corvette Kearsarge, which destroyed the Confederate cruiser Alabama off Cherbourg during the Civil War, was wrecked on Roncador Reef in the Caribbean Sea. The Kearsarge, February 2nd, 1894. In the gloomy ocean bed dwelt a formless thing, and said, in the dim and countless eons long ago, I will build a stronghold high, ocean's power to defy, and the pride of haughty man to lay low. 
crept the minutes for the sad sped the cycles for the glad but the march of time was neither less nor more while the formless Adam died, myriad millions by its side, and above them slowly lifted Roncador. Roncador of Caribbee, coral dragon of the sea, ever sleeping with his teeth below the wave. Woe to him who breaks the sleep! Woe to them who sail the deep! Woe to ship and man that fear a shipman's grave! Hither many a galleon old, heavy keeled with guilty gold, fled before the hardy rover smiting sore. But the sleeper silent lay, till the prayer and his prey brought their plunder and their bones to Roncador. Be content, O conqueror, now our bravest ship of war, war and tempest who had often braved before, all her storied prowess past strikes her glorious flag at last to the formless thing that builded roncador james jeffrey roche in eighteen ninety six tennessee celebrated the one hundredth anniversary of her admission to the union by an exposition held at nashville tennessee prize centennial ode june first eighteen ninety six she is touching the cycle her tender tread is soft on the hearts of her hallowed dead, and she proudly stands where her sons have led for God in Tennessee, where the love of her women set the seal of the warrior's faith for the country's weal, with hand on the rifle and hand on the wheel by the altars of Tennessee. They have builded well for the niche of fame, though the sleet of want and the heart of blame, but the courage of heroes tried the flame as they builded Tennessee. "'Twas up to the portholes and down in the dust, "'not the weight of might but the force of must, "'with faith and rifle-bore free from rust, "'they were building Tennessee. "'Twas up in the saddle and off to the fight, "'where arrow and tomahawk shrieked in the light, "'but the sinews of pioneers won for the right "'the bulwarks of Tennessee. "'She was true when they pressed like a shadowy fate "'her royal foes at her unbarred gate, and is true when were menaced her rights of state, the mother Tennessee. And she gave of her life for the stars and bars, as she gave of her sons for the earlier wars, and the breast of her motherhood wears the scars for the manhood of Tennessee. But she wrought again in the strength of might, in the face of defeat and a yielded right, the cloth of gold from the loom of night, the mantle of Tennessee. She has given all that she held most dear with a Spartan hope and a Spartan fear, crowned in her statehood volunteer, glorious Tennessee. She has rounded the cycle, the tale is told, the circlet is iron, the clasp is gold, and the leaves of a wonderful past unfold, the garland of Tennessee. And her garments gleam in the sunset years, and the songs of her children fill her ears, and the listening heart of the great world hears the peons of Tennessee. Virginia Fraser Boyle On May 31, 1897, a monument to the memory of Robert Gould Shaw, who fell at the head of his colored regiment during the Civil War, was unveiled on Boston Common. The monument, designed by Augustus San Gaudin, is perhaps the most noteworthy of its kind in America. An Ode on the Unveiling of the Shaw Memorial on Boston Common, May 31, 1897 Not with the slow funereal sound come we to this sacred ground, not with wailing fife and solemn muffled drum, bringing a cypress wreath to lay with bended knee on the cold brows of death. Not so, dear God, we come, but with the trumpet's blare, and shot-torn battle banners flung to air as for a victory. Hark to the measured tread of martial feet, the music and the murmurs of the street. No bugle breathes this day disaster and retreat. Hark how the iron lips of the great battleship salute the city from her azure bay. Time was, time was, ah, unforgotten years, we paid our hero tribute of tears. But now let go all sounds and signs and formulas of woe. Tis life, not death, we celebrate. To life, not death, we dedicate this storied bronze, whereon is wrought the lithe immortal figure of our thought, to show forever to men's eyes, our children's, children's, children's eyes, how once he stood in that heroic mood, he and his dusky braves so fain of glorious graves. 
one instant stood and then drave through that cloud of purple steel and flame which wrapped him held him gave him not again but in its trampled ashes left to fame an everlasting name that was indeed to live at one bold swoop to wrest from darkling death the best that death to life can give he fell his roland fell that day at roncevaux with foot upon the ramparts of the foe a peon not a knell for heroes dying so no need for sorrow here no room for sigh or tear save such rich tears as happy eyelids know see where he rides our knight within his eyes the light of battle and youth's gold about his brow our paladin our soldier of the cross not weighing gain with loss world loser that won all obeying duty's call not his at perils frown a pulse of quicker beat nor his to hesitate and parley hold with fate but proudly to fling down his gauntlet at her feet o soul of loyal valor and white truth here by this iron gate thy serried ranks about thee as of yore stand thou forevermore in thy undying youth the tender heart the eagle eye o oh, unto him belong the homages of song our praises and the praise of coming days to him belong to him to him the dead that shall not die thomas bailey aldrich the years eighteen ninety seven and eighteen ninety eight witnessed a great rush of gold seekers to alaska where placer gold in large quantities had been discovered the year before in the yukon district on klondike creek the klondike eighteen ninety eight never mind the day we left or the way the women clung to us all we need now is the last way they looked at us never mind the twelve men there amid the cheering twelve men or one man twill soon be all the same for this is what we know we are five men together five left of twelve men to find the golden river for we came to find it out but the place was here for all of us far far we came and here we have the last of us we that were the front men we that would be early we that had the faith and the triumph in our eyes we that had the wrong road twelve men together singing when the devil sang to find the golden river say the gleam was not for us but never say we doubted it say the wrong road was right before we followed it we that were the front men fit for all forage say that while we dwindle we are front men still for this is what we know to-night we're starving here together starving on the wrong road to find the golden river wrong we say but wait a little hear him in the corner there he knows more than we and he'll tell us if we listen there he that fought the snow sleep less than all the others stays a while yet and he knows where he stays foot and hand a frozen clout brain a freezing feather still he's here to talk with us and to the golden river flow he says and flow along but you cannot flow away from us all the world's ice will never keep you far from us every man that heeds your call takes the way that leads him the one way that's his way and lives his own life starve or laugh the game goes on and on goes the river gold or no they go their way twelve men together twelve he says who sold their shame for a lure you call too fair for them you that laugh and flow to the same word that urges them twelve who left the old town shining in the sunset left the weary street and the small safe days twelve who knew but one way out wide the way or narrow twelve who took the frozen chance and laid their lives on yellow flow by night and flow by day nor ever once be seen by them flow freeze and flow till time shall hide the bones of them laugh and wash their names away leave them all forgotten leave the old town to crumble where it sleeps leave it there as they have left it shining in the valley leave the town to crumble down and let the women marry twelve of us are five he says we know the night is on us now five while we last and we may as well be thinking now 
thinking each his own thought, knowing when the light comes, five left or none left, the game will not be lost. Crouch or sleep, we go the way, the last way, together. Five or none, the game goes on, and on goes the river. For after all that we have done, and all that we have failed to do, life will be life, and the world will have its work to do. Every man who follows us will heed in his own fashion the calling, and the warning, and the friends who do not know. Each will hold an icy knife to punish his heart's lover, and each will go the frozen way to find the golden river. There you hear him, all he says and the last will ever get from him. Now he wants to sleep, and that will be the best for him. Let him have his own way. No, you needn't shake him. Your own turn will come, so let the man sleep. For this is what we know. We are stalled here together, hands and feet and hearts of us, to find the golden river. And there's a quicker way than sleep, never mind the looks of him. All he needs now is a finger on the eyes of him. You there, on the left hand, reach a little over. Shut the stars away, or he'll see them all night. He'll see them all night, and he'll see them all tomorrow, crawling down the frozen sky, cold and hard and yellow. Won't you move an inch or two to keep the stars away from him? No, he won't move, and there's no need of asking him. Never mind the twelve men, never mind the women. Three while we last, we'll let them all go, and we'll hold our thoughts north while we starve here together, looking each his own way to find the Golden River. Edwin Arlington Robinson End of Chapter 4, Part 2 of Poems of American History, Volume 5, The Period of Expansion Recording by Philip Gould